And we're going to um, obviously have a great evening tonight. I always love doing these because um, basically we, we're going to give you that aha moment hopefully tonight because I, I'm not sure if all of you realize how prevalent these issues are that we see in these young children. Um, so much attention has been brought to um, sleep apnea in adults, and we realize how prevalent it is in adults. Well, if we take a step backwards, we can kind of realize that this just didn't appear in adulthood. It was actually developing over a course of many years. And many of the adults you talk to, if you ask them a lot of these questions we're going to pose tonight, they'll probably tell you this was me when I was a child. So I think a lot of this starts very early. There's even studies that show that a lot of these symptoms even appear prior to birth. So um, it's an interesting topic. And I think to put it in perspective, the research shows nine out of 10 children have one or more of these outward symptoms. How many children says that represent in the United States? About 40 million. So it is much more about it being an epidemic. And unfortunately, it's silent and most of the times undiagnosed. So with that, let's get going and um, we can start talking about what I would say sleep-related breathing disorder. It's a little bit different than what we talk about with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is more of a diagnosis and unfortunately in adults, it's more of a permanent condition. With the child, because they're growing and developing, it's more of a fluid situation that if we can address the underlying symptoms, we can basically um, make a change in that child's life and a change in the trajectory of where their health is going. So the ADA, as well as the AAO, have put together some guidelines for um, their doctors. And basically, it is to ensure that every dentist, even orthodontists, are evaluating for airway, sleep, and breathing issues. And a lot of this will have to do with improper growth and development. So it really is the responsibility for each and every one of you. Um, we might even have some hygienist on um, the meeting tonight. And even for a hygienist, um, you're always evaluating um, your patient's teeth, but identifying what these underlying root causes are is so critical just in the conversation that you have with your patients. So as I had mentioned, we estimate nine out of 10 children suffer from one or more of these outward symptoms. And these outward symptoms include mouth breathing, snoring, teeth grinding, swollen adenoids and tonsils, chronic allergies, eczema, asthma, ADD, ADHD, aggressive behavior, depression, irritability, anger, pair problems, many times with few friends, bedwetting, even at an older age, difficulty in school, especially in the subjects of math, science, and spelling, delayed or stunted growth, restless sleep, nightmares, morning headaches, daytime drowsiness, frequently waking up at night, sleep talking and walking. It is a silent crisis among America's children. And I will make one other additional comment. I just returned from, believe it or not, Albania last night. And um, it doesn't matter where I go in the world. I've recently been in Germany, um, Norway, um, Manila, Hong Kong, um, Albania. It doesn't matter where we are, these symptoms pertain to children across the world. So yes, we're looking at America right now, but really this is something that's universal to almost all children that we see, no matter where they live in the world. So when we look at these outward symptoms that we just described, what parents currently are doing is looking at them in isolation. So for instance, your child might have ADD and ADHD. And we see a specialist for that. They might have asthma. We go see another specialist for that. They might have allergies. Here we go, a third specialist. And each specialist is going to recommend different ways of treating those symptoms. And they can include drugs, um, testing, counseling, surgery, sleep studies, allergy testing, sleep aids, um, diet changes, um, a, a whole litany. Um, but what is really interesting is 
that there is such a lack of knowledge that these outward symptoms could all be connected to underlying root causes. So unfortunately, many times when a parent will go to a specialist to address these individual items, many of the solutions or the treatments are basically just addressing the symptoms. They're not recognizing or addressing the root cause. Uh, many times they tend to be short-term band-aids they involve several drugs with many side effects. And unfortunately, these treatments can be costly, painful, time consuming, and ineffective. So when we look at these outward symptoms, what we're talking about is these outward symptoms basically provide us a clue of a more important underlying root cause or causes that basically because of these deficiencies or improper habits, et cetera, basically cause difficulty in the way a child breathes, the way the child can sleep, and the development of their airway that can all contribute to what we refer to as sleep-related breathing disorders. So again, the root causes we're going to be focusing on are mouth breathing, including various other habits, narrow palate, improper tongue placement, and jaw relationships. I would add an additional one to that is improper growth and development, which all can contribute to the above. So how do we screen for sleep? How do each one, no matter if you're from a dental background, an orthodontic background, a pediatric dentist, a hygienist, we even sometimes have pediatricians on, ENTs, these are all important criteria that we should all be familiar with so that we are more effectual in our evaluation for children that are suffering in sleep, breathing, and airway. So the very first way to start the evaluation is just take a physical assessment of the child. Is this child a healthy child? We'll take a look at the girl on the left. Notice the large dark circles under her eyes. Also look at how her face is perched forward. Tendency is if children are having difficulty gaining enough air, they will tend to lurch their head forward. It tends to open up the airway and give them the, a better ability to increase the air. The child on the left, same kind of symptoms, but look at the circles under his eyes. Notice how his lips are parted, a good indication that he probably mouth breathes. You'll also see a rolled lip, another indication. Take a look at how his head and neck appear. It almost looks like he has a double chin. This child is not heavy. However, the appearance, maybe the retronathic lower chin, um, provides that look that makes them look more um, heavy than they really are. Take a look at the child's profile. Try to just make a visual line down the side of the profile and see how that lower third of the face lines up. You can already see how deficient this child is in the mandible. Look at the rolled lips, lips parted, um, typically a mouth breather. You can see the circles under her eyes. The girl on the right, same but just slightly different reasoning. Take a look at her profile again. Look at the deficiency of the lower third, especially the mandible. Again, a rolled lip, you can see circles under her eyes, but look at how the chin and the neck, it's almost like it blends together. Sometimes we call that a funnel look. These are all concerning features of these children that obviously you would want to take additional look. I, this is probably the best tool that you have in your toolbox, and it is a Healthy Start Sleep Questionnaire. And what makes this sleep questionnaire so unique is that it is going to have a parent evaluate the top 27 outward symptoms of sleep, breathing and airway. But what it's gonna do in addition is give a score depending on the severity of that condition being from zero to five, five being the most pronounced. So not only are we going to indicate what symptoms that child is exhibiting, but how severe they are. Now look at item number 27. It talks about speech problems. So on the lower portion are typical issues that we would recognize in speech that reflect possibly um, 
a problem with sleep, breathing, and airway, but also more importantly with the tongue. Tongue placement, tongue strength um, is really key in a lot of these issues that we see with speech. Um, I would absolutely use this um, day in and day out. Maybe it should be become um, part of the medical history of each and every one of your patients. Here is a interesting um, research study that was done on over 500 children. And it was in regard to the incidence of sleep disorder breathing symptoms within a sleep questionnaire. So the results that was found was basically mouth breathing and snoring are commonly associated with more sleep disorder breathing symptoms than any other symptom studied. Nine out of 10 children had one or more symptoms of sleep disorder breathing. 60% of the sample had four or more symptoms. One out of five children experienced bedwetting. I kind of want to pause and just reflect on that because this was really an eye opener for me that 18.6% of older children will bed wet. Now, I had no idea it was that prevalent. So when I talk about it, I say, if you, you go, maybe you have a child in a classroom of 20 kids. Out of that classroom, four of them are going to probably be bedwetters. And if you talk, well, we've talked to more and more children that have experienced this and families as well. And really the detriment of bedwetting is terrible. These children tend to um, obviously don't go on sleepovers. Many of them don't attend camps. Um, we had one girl that um, was a bedwetter up until she was 18. And um, she, during our conversations and initiation of treatment, she kind of fessed up to her mom that the reason why she didn't want to go to college was because how would she ever attend a college when she had this issue? Um, it was so sad to hear that story and to realize that um, bedwetting can be associated with sleep, breathing, and airway and can be um, possibly treated with this, symptom, with this series of treatments. So we'll go into that a little bit later, but I just want to bring that up because obviously we don't talk about it a lot. Um, sometimes parents fail to put it on the sleep questionnaire. Um, we always make a point to bring it up just in a third person that many times we'll see children who exhibit a lot of these symptoms and bedwetting is also one of them. You'll know right off the bat if a parent, how a parent and a child look after you ask that question. And it's just, we want to know so that we can make sure that this treatment can assist in that type of treatment and hopefully resurrection of that outward symptom. Um, the last point is between ages four and 12, 92.6% of the symptoms will not self-correct while 30% worsen with age. That's a really important statistic. That means if you see a parent or you're talking to a parent and a child and you're explaining these outward symptoms, that child has less than an 8% chance that it will self-correct. The odds are really not with that child. And a parent can make a more educated decision whether to proceed with treatment. So these numbers are really vital in a parent's decision um, to go ahead with treatment. Um, we say, if you see it, we treat it. Um, we, we know it's not going to get better. It's probably going to get worse or remain the same. But I don't really feel that a child should endure a lot of these outward symptoms um, through their lifetime. I mean, health is an issue, how they perform in school, their ability to socialize. These are all critical things that happen so early in life. And if we can basically remove those barriers will let a child soar, reach their potential. So um, these numbers are really important and obviously we talk about them a lot. Um, mouth breathing is the number one outward symptom that we see. 43% of this sample um, were mouth breathers. Um, I will say, sometimes people say, well, my child doesn't snore. Um, snoring is an easy outward symptom to identify. Obviously you can hear it. But not all snorers, or I should say, all snorers are mouth breathers. However, you can be a mouth breather and not snore. So sometimes we use the words audible breathing. If you can hear a child breathe, they're mouth breathing. Why is mouth breathing so detrimental? Well, 
because if we open the mouth by just a half an inch, it will reduce the airway by six millimeters. What does that really mean? Well, take a seven-year-old. A seven-year-old has a seven millimeter airway. If that seven-year-old is mouth breathing, they're reducing their airway by six millimeters down to one millimeter. Try breathing through a one millimeter airway. It is extremely difficult. We'll talk later on about how a coffee stirrer is a good indication. It's a good visual for parents to see. That's about a one millimeter airway. Um, I always joke, it's, it's really not a joke. It's more of a really serious comment. I tried to, one day I decided I was going to try to spend the entire day breathing through a coffee stirrer. I really wanted to feel what that felt like and um, how difficult it was. So um, I made it maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I had the most massive headache. I tried et cetera, and I tried everything. I could not get rid of it. Well, fortunately, that night I went to sleep, and in the morning, I felt much better. But I think about those children that have it each and every night. They never have the opportunity to overcome what they're feeling. And they don't probably have the mechanisms to explain to a parent or to their doctor or their dentist or their hygienist um, what they're feeling because they probably felt it for the majority of their life. So that's part of, that is basically one of the big um, detriments of mouth breathing. We also find that children that mouth breathe will typically exhibit eight other outward symptoms. And a lot of these other outward symptoms include snoring, difficulty listening, often interrupting, talking while sleeping, allergic symptoms, fidgets with hands, restless sleep, teeth grinding, feels sleepy or irritable during the day. And, and these are not great things to be um, characteristic of your children. So what are the implications of this study? Well, the findings show that sleep disorder breathing is much more common and affects children as young as two years of age. Well, we've actually seen other studies that have actually gone even further to say that they see sleep issues, meaning that a child is sucking their thumb, they're already mouth breathing, in the womb. So we, we already see these deficiencies. Um, again, we said begin treatment as early as possible to ensure permanent changes. Identifying outward symptoms displayed in 90% of the children that enter your practice can significantly reduce this epidemic and enable you to successfully treat the overall health of your patients. So let's talk about airway and addressing the habitual issues. Like we just talked about a coffee stirrer versus a garden hose. We're looking for a garden hose, that's our goal. Sometimes I say when they mouth breathe, it's almost like putting a kink in the garden hose. Um, that's kind of the situation that occurs. Um, sometimes this is a better image for parents to identify. So look at the image on the far right you can see that dot represents a seven millimeter diameter airway. And for a seven-year-old, that would represent 100% airflow. Well, remember when I said about mouth breathing, basically reduces that airway by six millimeters. Well, to go all the way to the left-hand side, and that dot represents one millimeter diameter airway. Look at the comparison of those two and that represents 11% airflow. So they're severely compromised. And we'll talk about what that means in regard to their ability to sleep well. REM sleep requires oxygen. At 11% airflow, that is a not enough oxygen in order to get into REM sleep. What happens when you don't get into REM sleep? Well, we obviously don't have the reparative sleep but it basically throws the body into imbalance, meaning that it's going to affect the hormonal, the endocrine, the immune system um, because of this. And other issues occur, which are part of the conversation that we talked about with the outward symptoms of sleep. Why are these situations happening? Well, we see that it has a lot to do with prolonged use of pacifiers. That means longer than six months prolonged use of nipple bottles, a lack of breastfeeding, and a soft diet. So why do all these make a difference? Well, let's talk about a pacifier and a bottle feeding. That 
particular item depresses the tongue. So the tongue isn't up in the palate where it needs to be. So when we say the letter N, where that sound ends should be where your tongue should be at rest. Um, just if you're trying this, don't worry. I know most of us do not have our tongue in the right position. Why? No one ever told us. Why? Because maybe we had prolonged use of pacifiers and nipple bottles that depressed our tongue. Um, maybe our tongue hasn't built up the strength, so it's hard for it to be lifted up into the palate amount. There's a variety of reasons. Um, lack of breastfeeding is another. Obviously, breastfeeding helps to develop the oral cavity. Um, it helps develop the tongue. The tongue is our most powerful muscle in our body. So if it is not toned and it is not in shape, it's not going to be basically performing the duties that it needs to do. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how we can help ensure that the tongue is in the correct position and how do we strengthen it? How do we increase its endurance? And um, Healthy Start has a way of addressing those issues. Um, a soft diet. Um, look at this, graduate pups, the nutritious snack that melts in a baby's mouth. Well, we're not using that chewing motion to help develop and expand our dentition. So basically the foundation of our oral cavity is lacking. So that's why um, a soft diet has basically contributed to this whole condition. Um, are these things that are hard to overcome? Well, you know, the breastfeeding is hard because most parents work um, two jobs. Um, pacifiers, yes, we can limit the use of it to six months. Um, the nipple bottom should end beyond or before six to eight months of age. And obviously soft diet, if we can eliminate some of these artificial, um, I don't know what you even call them, items or what they consider food and put it with more nutritional choices. Um, steak is not bad for children. We're always so worried they're gonna choke. Well, it does have another function. It's basically helping to provide that development of the oral cavity. So these are just items that you can help a parent understand. And if you're thinking about your own children, it, it basically will assist in that as well. So these are some of the or, um, orthodontic issues that occur because of these issues. Um, open bite, tongue thrust, usually a result of pacifier and prolonged nipple use. Um, it also can be a result of finger sucking or thumb sucking. When we look at the airway, sometimes we're talking about the nasal cavity. Um, we talk about soft palate versus hard palate. We also should look at the nasal pharynx and the oral pharynx. And these all are areas that are we going to look at as being compromised um, because of either airway issues, um, improper breathing, um, improper habits and improper growth and development. So we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit more about how those contribute to this conversation. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about mouth breathing. Why is mouth breathing negative? Well, it's because we're not using our nose. Our nose is the proper nasal passage. Why? It really has five functions. It serves as an air passageway. It warms and moistens inhaled air. Um, its membrane traps dust, um, pollen, bacteria, and other foreign matter. It contains receptors which sort out odors and it can aid in pronunciation and the quality of voice. So it has many important functions that we need to make sure um, we're utilizing. How many times do we see this kind of situation of a child? Just so you know, this car was not operating. It was at a standstill. The mom did not want to take the child out because she was sound asleep. Um, she made her more comfortable by wrapping the seatbelt behind her. But the idea from this is how many times have you seen a child mouth open, sound asleep, maybe just going to school, maybe a play date. A child should have more energy than this, than to fall asleep just randomly in a car. So as we said, mouth breathing occurs in 43% of the study that we did with over 500 children. 
Um, this is a really important video. I think it kind of sums up of what we're going to talk about and what we see in these kids. So I want you to listen um, and just um, hear what this um, mother is saying as well. Now he's holding it. That was holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. Now watch. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's still holding his breath. And now he's going to gulp again. There he goes. That was it again. And it's holding. It's holding. There he goes. This has been three minutes and 15 seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now, watch what happens when I take his jaw and I just bring it forward. If I can, let's see if I can. And I open his airway. I'm opening his airway, just pulling his jaw forward ever so slightly. And now he's breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. That's my hair up quietly, and you don't hear him anymore. And all I did is gently bring his jaw forward. So how amazing is that? Um, you can see if we could create an appliance that would bring the lower jaw forward, it would open up the airway, we could prevent the mouth breathing, encourage the nasal breathing, put the tongue in the right position, expand the arches enough so the tongue could sit in the upper palate, and promote the growth and development to allow a child to develop into that position in a more permanent fashion, that would be ideal. Well, that's kind of what Healthy Start does. In fact, it's exactly what Healthy Start does. So when we look at the airway, these are two separate five-year-olds. The five-year-old on the left, you can see a constricted airway. Now realize 21% of the population will have a constricted airway in a vertical position. On the right-hand side, you'll see a normal airway. The problem is we want to look at more of the individual in a horizontal position because at night when a child sleeps, the muscles do relax and the airway will tend to close. So we, we take this as best scenario for these children. Now, if we have a child that has an open airway, that doesn't guarantee that that child will not have breathing problems. Because as we talked about before, this child, same patient, the one on the left has a normal airway, but look what happens when just opening their mouth or mouth breathing by a half an inch, look what happens. The airway will close about six millimeters. So you can see what that issue is and how that mouth breathing contributes to basically the narrowing or elimination of um, the airway. This is a really interesting case that was treated with the Healthy Start system. Um, the image on the left is basically the individual at the onset of treatment. What's interesting is how we determine what we would consider normal airway measurement. So we typically take the age of the patient starting at age five, multiply by 10. So this patient here is basic is nine years old. So it would be nine times 10. So we would anticipate a 90 square millimeter airway. Well, this nine-year-old registered 
53.6. So he's already compromised. So what we did was a month with wearing the habit corrector, we took a second CVCT scan with the appliance in the mouth to see what kind of expansion of airway we were getting. Now, from the beginning to this image, we get six times an increase in the airway. Now, what does 337 really mean? Well, in an adult, as we grow at age 17, we actually peak out and we typically would anticipate an airway between 150 and 170 square millimeters. Bad news is at age 21, our airway starts to deteriorate over the course of our entire life. So we never know, for instance, uh, an adult sleep apnea patient, if they had reached the potential of 150 to 170 square millimeters um, around age 17, or, or maybe that patient was compromised to begin with and sleep apnea set in. But if we can expand the airway to a number that's double what we would anticipate an adult, we have a whole lot of leeway. So these are the images and this is part of the research. We're currently in six different research projects that are evaluating this discussion. And we're also looking at the stability of these type of created airways. So obviously we'll keep you posted. Um, we're, we're very excited about this breakthrough and what this could mean um, in the treatment of sleep related breathing disorders in children. So here is just um, a graph of what we had just spoken about. So going back to what we are discussing and understanding the entire circle of this situation, we realize that mouth breathing and storing usually results from extended bottle use and feeding pacifier use. Um, mouth breathing can cause poor tongue position and abnormal swallowing. Uh, many times sugar processed foods will affect or create the mouth breathing. Um, poor oral habits, thumb, finger, lip sucking, tongue thrusts, et cetera, also contribute. So from mouth breathing, we leads to a compromised airway. And a compromised airway reduces the airway, restricts airflow, reduces oxygen, increases CO2, affects brain function, immune and endocrine systems, swollen adenoids and tonsils, low tongue position, tongue thrust, underdeveloped dental arches such as overjet, open bite, and even crossbite. And this compromised airway can contribute to the outward symptoms we see with sleep disorder breathing. And again, we had the 27 symptoms, which include restless sleep, ADD, ADHD, bedwetting, chronic allergies, nightmares, daytime, drowsiness, um, et cetera. So you kind of understand that whole circle of thought and what leads to the next condition. Let's take a look at what the MRI shows us about sleep. So the first three images on the top reflect an MRI of a normal brain function after a normal night's sleep. You can see a lot of activity in the yellow and red um, indicators. The lower three Im images are again as an MRI, uh, excuse me, an MRI of brain function with one night of sleep deprivation. If you look very closely, you can see a little area of brain activity. But all in all, look at the detriment that one night lack of sleep can create in brain function. So let's talk about Healthy Start and what we can do. We're 51 years plus. We're actually celebrating um, 52 years. Um, we've treated 4 million children worldwide. Um, and the appliances look something like this. So we have appliances and systems that basically address different ages. And these ages reflect more of the skeletal development of that child. So typically the first appliance that we typically start with are the, called the habit corrector. So we had one for the toddler, age two to four. We have the kids habit corrector, which is typically from four to seven. If first-year-old molars are present and we have a child that's over the age of seven, we would go into what we call the healthy start preteen. And then the last is the adult one that usually is for children 12 and over. So what 
root causes does Healthy Start address? Well, we expand the dental arches, we establish nasal breathing, we train the tongue, we eliminate bad habits, we advance the mandible to correct the overjet, we encourage proper facial and body growth, and we correct most orthodontic problems. Um, we correct in these orthodontic problems, any overbite and overjet, we provide interperfect intercuspation of the dentition, um, a molar relation to a class one. We have all the 28 teeth in place by the age of 12. And we provide stability by creating the fiber development on these straight teeth that were guided into place and therefore reducing or eliminating future relapse. So the first product or the first appliance in the system is called the Haber Corrector. And the Haber Corrector actually includes a built-in myofunctional therapy. So how does it do that? Well, we do have different areas and items that basically encourage the proper swallow, um, encourage expansion of the upper, upper arth, arch, allows the tongue to move and be directed up into the palate, into that proper space, as well as preventing the lower chin from drifting back and encouraging nasal breathing from mouth breathing. So we'll see that we have expansion tabs here that basically expand the arches. We see a lingual shelf, or I like to call it a ramp. It is on an incline, so every time we swallow, the tongue will go up the ramp. These prongs here basically prevent the tongue thrust, but also indicate when to retrieve the tongue. At the same time, we have these lower tabs that prevent the lower chin from drifting back. We do include posterior pads if the patient has an open bite to help close that quickly. We have a shield in front that prevents mouth breathing, therefore encouraging nasal breathing. So all of these are basically um, incurred by a swallow. At night, we swallow one time a minute. During the day, we swallow two times a minute. So just by wearing the habit corrector at night, we're going to reinforce those proper swallowing habits almost 500 times each and every night. So it's such an effective way to gain the myofunctional therapy, to train the mouth, the tongue, and the proper habits so that a child reinforces it every night, basically changing that pattern and allowing it to be a permanent habit for the years to come. Another one, uh, another item we want to check is basically um, to ensure the child has proper swallowing habits. And we can actually kind of decipher what is going on or how difficult or if we see these improper swallowing habits um, present. And the easiest way is take a glass of water, whether you put it on your operatory, but allow the child to take a glass of water and really focus on how he swallows. If he's swallowing properly, the only thing that you see move is literally the neck muscles. If the tongue is in the wrong position, thus for or therefore causing an improper swallow, you'll start to see the entire facial um, muscles move in um, uh, a way in order to create that swallow. So you'll see the lips puckering, you'll see squinting of the face. Um, it's very interesting. What we should see is no movement in those facial muscles. And as we go through treatment, every time the child comes in for his appointment, we'll continue to ask him to basically swallow a glass of water just to see how much improvement that child's gained by using the habit corrector at night and really changing um, how that tongue is positioned, the endurance, and creating the proper swallow for him. Um, another interesting study that is um, going to be printed um, soon um, was done on a sample size of 220 patients. And it basically watched these kids for a six month period to see the amount of correction that happened with these outward symptoms. So if we take the first one, headaches, we see that 40 children out of the sample size of 220, that's 18%, exhibit headaches. We saw a 98% correction, um, cases having improvement. 
we see 94% of the mean correction of those with improvement. We see 91% mean correction of the entire sample and 85% of the cases with 100% correction. That's huge. But you can see that each item has been indicated and evaluated. And the reason being is we want you, when you have your patients coming in, that you kind of know what the percentage is so you can inform that to the parent and what we anticipate to correct in six months time. That's not to say the habit corrector isn't worn further and we do have the next appliances that will be worn to further encourage the proper growth and development and then obviously help these habits, um, these outward signs um, dissipate or um, be eliminated to um, hopefully 100%, but 100% is a hard number to always gain, but obviously make significant changes. So ADD and ADHD, always such an interesting conversation as it relates to sleep disorder breathing. So currently, the most recent research showed that 85% of the children with ADD and ADHD had sleep issues. That's a huge number. Why could that be? Well, the criteria we use to evaluate and to diagnose ADD and ADHD is the same criteria we use to evaluate sleep disorder breathing. Does that mean that these two can be misdiagnosed? Absolutely. Um, we, we know that ADD and ADHD is not a blood test. It is a criteria. And our conversation usually lends, if you suspect a child to have ADD or ADHD-like symptoms, evaluate the sleep first. By addressing the sleep, maybe we eliminate these outward symptoms that resembled ADD and ADHD. Or maybe we eliminate a lot of these other areas that make the ADD and ADHD just a much easier and manageable type of treatment. So again, evaluate sleep first. Um, some of the big leaders in um, evaluating ADD and ADHD includes Karen Bonnick. She actually um, evaluated over 13,000 participants. And some of her findings included sleep disorder breathing increases the risk of ADD and ADHD by at least 50%. ADD and ADHD patients have little or no REM sleep, but they have delta sleep. Patients without ADD and ADHD have primarily REM sleep and delta sleep. And in the study that we did with 501 patients, we found that ADHD was present in 25.2% of the cases. So here are some um, sad but um, important um, data that we should recognize. So in regard to ADD and ADHD, we find 50% of the children that have been diagnosed are held back one grade. 30% are held back two grades. Well, if it's truly a sleep issue, it doesn't matter if you hold them back 10 grades, they're still going to exhibit the same type of outward symptoms. Another study that basically reflected children who have sleep disorder breathing, they found that their IQs were reduced by 10 to 20 points. Well, in my world, I think college or no college. But they went one step further and they said, what is the value of each IQ point over a lifetime of a child? And they found that value to be $170,000 for each IQ point. So you can kind of see where this is going and how serious this is and obviously how important it is for early intervention. So Promoting growth and development is another area that Healthy Start will address. As we know, majority of the cranial facial growth occurs prior to age 12. Um, if you look at a four-year-old, you see that 74% of the development has occurred in the male and 79% in the female. So again, another reason and another um, factor that plays into treatment time, again, earlier is better. Um, we also look at how a child's profile, we talked about that because we promote forward growth. You can take a look at this. Here is a Healthy Start patient. 
at five years of age, you can see how underdeveloped that lower third of the face is. Um, she has a lot of other orthodontic conditions, but let's talk about just the underdevelopment of that lower jaw. A year and a half later, during treatment, we found that that child, look at the amount of forward growth. But in a Finnish study, one of the largest orthodontic studies that have been conducted on the Healthy Start treatment, we saw 54% more growth in the mandible than in the control sample. So you can see the amount of growth that occurs with use of these appliances. We also have an interesting appliance called the Max A Corrector. It's for maxillary advancer. It comes in two sizes, age two to six and six to 12. And what makes it so unique is there is no frontal wall of this appliance and there are tabs in the rear and the tongue presses on those tabs in order to drive that upper arch in a forward direction. At the same time, the lower portion of the appliance will drag or bring the mandible in unison. So we're going to move both the upper and lower arch in a forward direction. So here you can see, here's the initial, here's one month in progress, and here is current. Once we've made that correction, we'll move into the other appliances that make up the healthy start because we find we can basically promote that forward growth for that child and continue making those progresses. Also a class three corrector. Um, again, the appliance is designed in that similar fashion where the upper wall is missing on the upper portion. Tabs are on the back. The tongue is instructed to push against the tabs. It drives the upper arch in a forward direction. The lower portion has a lip bumper in place so that we will basically be able to make that jump for a child. Typically, it is worn two to four months. Um, and again, it comes in two sizes, two to six and six to 12. Treatment planning. So we do have a diagnostic form that we use. It helps us um, identify current conditions, um, functional problems, a lack of growth and development, and it's actually very thorough. So we have a very good overview of exactly what that patient is um, currently exhibiting. And all of this is put together and we go over it in our digital series so that you feel comfortable with filling out those types of diagnosis. So now the fun start. Let's, let's take a look at some of the cases and see what we can do. Um, this particular child is age seven, and you can take a look at basically the 27 symptoms. This child is representing um, 17, which is quite serious. And you can see a lot of fours. Um, there's quite a few fives as well. Um, anyways, this, this is a serious. And you can see on number 27, speech problems, um, the parent wrote very delayed speech, didn't say any words up to age three or four. So obviously a serious case. What makes this even more unique is this child, prior to the sleep questionnaire, did have tonsillectomy and his adenoids removed. And one month afterwards, it did not change. So this was the current condition even after having this type of um, surgery done. So you can see how detrimental. Now, the child word, they have a corrector, the first appliance for two months. And we had a second evaluation of these outward symptoms. And you can see all of them are zeros and ones. That's after two months only wearing the have a corrector. So now let's see what the child looked like, how we presented at the early set. This is March of 2015. You can see very deep bite. You can see a squareness of the arch, um, some circles, but take a look at his face because I'm gonna show you what he looks like the following year. Difficult to recognize him, changed so much. Um, whole facial structure. Take a look at his overbite, um, well on its way of being corrected. Look at the arch. Very nice, developing properly. Let's see what he looks like the following year. What changes? The teeth have settled in. You can see the nice arches in both the upper and lower. And obviously, most importantly, the health issues have disappeared. Here's another child, again, presenting with a deep bite. 
Um, here he is in progress. This case is not over, but what's significant is take a look at his sleep questionnaire. You can see wet in the bed, um, restless sleep. There's a lot of fours, threes, and I think one five. Two months later, um, let's see, all zeros except one, and that's the bed wetting. So interesting, and I thought this was interesting. The reason while this parent came in for treatment was crowded teeth. It wasn't because of these sleep issues. But as we know, crowded teeth is an indication that there's probably the narrowness of the arch. If there's the narrowness of the arch, the tongue isn't in the right position. If the tongue isn't in the palate of the mouth, it's probably laying low. And my guess is he's mouth breathing. So you can kind of see how the orthodontic conditions go hand in hand with these health issues that we're talking about. Here's another child. This is the initial. Here's her finish. You can see before and after. Here's kind of the progress. Here's the initial of the case. They're put into the first appliance. You can see the teeth are coming at a, quite an angle. The appliance captures these teeth, guides them in properly, corrects the overbite, and this is what the finish looks like. Here's another in initial and finish. Another initial and finish. Here's an interesting case whose mother had, at age 35, I believe, had surgery. Um, because um, of so many orthodontic conditions, but also um, sleep issues that she was having. Obviously, she recognized the same kind of appearance in her daughter, and she wanted better for her. So you can see, look at the deep bite. You can see the squareness of the arch. You can see the circles under her eyes. Look at the rolled lip, deficiency in the lower third. Here she is, totally different looking girl. You can see the correction of the overbite. You can see the arches, how they're developing. Here she is as she gets older. And you can see the stability of the case. Here's another case, snored, brox, bad breath, ear infections. About a year later, this is actually um, from a doctor's office in Canada, uh, in Alaska. So travels far to come see the doctor. Here's another one presented deep bite. You can see squareness of arch. Um, you can see a lot of fives here um, in this situation, uh, speech issues. Anyways, you can see after two months, mostly zeros and ones, you can see um, better resurrection of the overbite, roundness of the arches. Um, obviously, they're still in treatment. Um, spectrum, again, a series of outward symptoms, snores, brux. Here is mid-treatment. Here's final 14 years later. No retainers, no anything. This is just stability because of the appliance. Um, Wonderful is an app that comes with every treatment. Um, each patient will receive the app. It will be open to them so that they can track their compliance um, with every night they wear. They do get um, 30 minutes in game time or reading books. Um, they get a coin they can deposit in the bank, which they can accumulate and buy a, a present for themselves at the end. Um, every Friday, we ask them to take cheek retractors and take a selfie of them. Um, all of this information is stored into um, this unit that a parent can share with other family members, sort of like a flip book. And we also have this information stored in the doctor's portal. So during the 30 days or 45 days or 60 days, you don't see that patient, you can monitor their progression. I will mention that we have a 94% cooperation rate. So we are pretty good at getting kids to cooperate and get the success that we need. Um, again, as I said, we're 4 million cases worldwide. Um, we're FDA cleared, no latex, um, no silicone, phthalate free, BPA, BPS free. Um, we regulate ourselves to a class two medical device, meaning that these devices could be basically sealed in your body and they would be okay. It would not detriment the child's health. So we take this very seriously. We want your patients to be how we treat our own children. 
So um, I want to make sure that everybody understands how serious and um, how privileged we feel to be working with children and we take that responsibility very seriously. So I have kind of run through a very quick overview. Um, I want to, if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. And if not, I would love Susie to explain a little bit further on how you can become a provider and basically learn a little bit more about what we do, how we do, and um, treat some cases along the way. So Susie? Yeah, I would absolutely love to. Let me actually share my screen. There we go. So, um, I, so I don't see any questions. As Leslie said, um, you know, please feel free to ask. You can use that Q&A anytime and, and we'll um, pop on and, and answer those questions, any questions that you might have. But I would like to tell you a little bit about our digital education platform. Um, you know, one of the things I think that sets Healthy Starters apart is the is our certification course. You know, we required our doctors to go through um, certification to ensure that you have the training to not only understand um, how to assess these children, but we actually give you the treatment as, as Leslie has been talking about this evening. Our education course is fantastic because you can take it from anywhere in the world. And, and we actually have doctors from all over the world who actually take our course. Um, the, we ha actually have a course coming up on May the 20th. So it's coming up soon. It's actually perfect timing. It's a six session digital education course. Um, the policy that Leslie had chatted about earlier um, in the presentation, the ADA policy, this course actually complements that policy and gives you the education that you need to ensure that you can assess those kids. It actually comes with hands-on treatment of two full cases. And I think it's a, a fantastic way of learning because you not only are going to receive this comprehensive course, and it really is comprehensive. I mean, we want you to include every one of your staff members. I mean, we talk about everything from, of course, you know, the, the clinical side of things, but we also um, teach your staff members how to talk to the parent, how to bill, how to organize your office to ensure that you are as successful as you can be. And, and the, really the goal is to treat as many children as possible. I mean, that's what we, that's what we all want. So every Monday we send out a digital or a video rather and you have the entire week to watch that video series on Friday we do a live interactive study club and the live interactive study club is great because we actually bring on specialists every Friday to talk about these different kinds of things um, and so that every everything is recorded so that's what's great about it if you can't make it on on a Friday it's no big deal everything is recorded we always make sure that you are up to date um, with everything that's going on um, the two cases that I was talking about I mean that includes everything everything that you need to treat two kids, um, mainly because, I mean, the, the second that you hear this information, I mean, you already have these kids in your mind, I'm sure. It, it happens all the time. Um, you, you already have two kids that you know need to get started. You can get them started in the starter appliance, the habit corrector, um, so they can actually start sleeping and breathing um, better immediately. So it comes with a treatment plan. It comes with the appliances. It comes with specialty appliance cases. It comes with that Healthy Start app that Leslie was talking about. And if you are using this with, um, you know, parents in your practice um, and you're charging for this, that's basically close to $7,400 of potential treatment fees right there. So that's way more return on investment when, than what this course even costs. Um, you receive a $3,000 voucher to actually attend one of our destination courses as well. Again, we're giving you all of these different platforms, all of these different ways of learning. You have your digital, you have your hands, your treatment, um, your two cases so you can hands-on learn, and then you can actually attend a course as well. And that actually includes three of your staff members or four of your staff members actually. You'll receive a sample acrylic stand with sample appliances for your office, um, interactive study groups that go along with every presentation as I was talking about, and even a forum that we have online that you can join where you can actually talk with all kinds of different um, providers who are treating cases on a daily basis. So you can basically learn from each other, which is really which, which is really great. Um, so you're going to have training on pediatrics, um, I'm sorry, treatment of pediatric sleep-related breathing disorders and how to identify it in your patients, how to use Healthy Start to increase your patient flow. Um, as I mentioned, this includes you and your entire staff. 
18 CE PACE credits is what you'll earn for this course, and then 16 more when you attend a destination course. So a little bit about what some of the doctors are saying about our course. We had a doctor from Australia who attended who said our course was excellent. All at Healthy Star have really got their act together and offer resources others strive for but rarely achieve. Well organized, passionate, and supportive. Doctor in Canada, I want to thank you and your colleagues for this amazing course. I've been searching for a solid system to help my patients, and this is by far the best, most organized, comprehensive course I've taken. Doctor in Colorado, I've really enjoyed the courses. We've identified quite a few patients that will benefit from health, Healthy Start. My business partner's four year old is in the habit practice because he's had swallowing problems and we've already seen great improvement in his eating. We already have three more patients who are ready to get started next week. And I really love that particular um, testimony because Dr. Wright was only in her third week. So it's a six, um, a six series course. She was in her third week. And the reason that happens is because we're going to send you those starter appliances immediately. You can get those two kids started immediately. And so these parents are going to start seeing results. They're going to see healthier kids. They're going to, you know, suddenly their children are going to feel better. They're going to sleep better. They're going to start doing better in school, you know, all of those things are going to start happening and they're going to tell their friends and, you know, pretty soon you're going to have these parents calling you. ADA actually took our course and said it was ingenious, which I think is great high praise. So the um, financial metrics, what's the startup cost? So typically for most doctors who take our courses, the digital education course is $3,400. And again, that includes your entire staff. And then the in-person destination course is $400. So we actually do run promotions. And this particular promotion we're running for this evening is um, our digital course is $3,400, and then we are actually giving you the um, destination course. So it's a two-for-one. Um, you can attend the digital course, and you can attend the in-person course at no cost whatsoever. So it's a pretty pretty exciting, pretty good deal. We Again, you know, our goal is to get you guys educated. Our goal is to um, get you, get as many providers as we can helping children. I It's just it's too important. I mean, again, once you've learned this information, it's hard to unknow it. And, you know, you, you, we want you out there helping these kids. So you can actually sign up very easily. We make it really, really simple. You can visit www.openairwaydentistry.com. Um, there is a register now button on the page. You just click that button. You fill out the form that's on that button and you can sign up immediately. And so we'll receive your registration. We'll send you a welcome package in the mail that includes your acrylic stand, your sample appliances, your agenda for the course, your, you know, starter appliances to get going and just everything that you need to get started. And as I mentioned, the course starts on May the 20th. If you have additional questions, you can contact me. That's my email address, my personal email address. So you can email me directly and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, or, you know, I can get you signed up um, personally as well. So however, however works for you. I see that we have a couple of questions. I'm going to click on those really quickly. Um, oh, Leslie, actually, I'll bring you in really quickly if, if you're okay um, with that. So the first question is, this is a great question, and we get this question all the time, and Leslie's probably the perfect person to answer it. But it, the question is, what do you think about patient compliance? Um, well, it's obviously necessary for number one. But um, we've been doing this for a very long time. We've treated 4 million children. Um, we tend to come up with um, a really good system that makes it easy for a child to wear. Um, typically, they wear it, especially at the beginning, just passively at night when they sleep. Um, we, um, the appliance is designed. It's soft. It's squishy. Um, sometimes we refer to it as a pillow for your teeth. Kids seem to really like that comparison. Um, we talk about how we speak to a child. Um, we tend to never look down on a child. Um, a child is always looking up to everyone, no matter if it's a teacher, a sibling, a parent. So we tend to put them more in a position where um, they're looking down at us. Um, that makes the situation much different. Um, we work with the parent. Um, we do a lot of things um, to reward a child for cooperation. Um, and I, I'll tell you something that's really interesting in this whole series. Um, typically, we always worry about compliance with the child, um, if they're going to continue wearing it. We actually kind of have the uh, opposite problem. Um, once a child starts wearing this, 
we have more difficulty at the end of treatment telling them they don't know they no longer need to wear these appliances. Um, so um, I, I think we have some really good skills. We have some really good tricks of the trade. Um, we try to um, provide you with those um, ideas. Um, you'll also find with the digital, we do have a doctor forum that doctors get on. Um, they're always sharing other ideas that they have, they've heard um, others where they, you know, provide the success of what they've had. So it's really a very good learning environment. And obviously we make compliance one of our top priorities because um, we know how great the appliance is. They just have to wear it. So um, that, that's a really important part of our goal. So we did two big large studies. One was in Finland um, where they did three different cities and um, one city was control and the other two were done with the Healthy Start treatment. And we got 94% cooperation. So it was a pretty large group. Then we repeated it at Tufts University. And again, we got the same percentage, 94% cooperation. I actually think our numbers might be higher than that because I think we really do a really good job of um, doing the groundwork, how to talk to a child, all those little extras that make this system really um, um, applicable to a child, but make it a fun system. Um, typically we say no tears and healthy start, only fun and laughter. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll find that with what we do. Um, we take a lot of pride in um, being able to provide that information, pass it on to you so that you become, uh, that, uh, receive that same kind of success. Yeah, thank you so much. So, there, um, Dr. Yamani, I saw your message. She said that this morning, um, signed up for the digital course that starts on May the 20th, is asking if we'll honor that um, two for one. Absolutely. I, I, Leslie, are you good with that? I'm good with that. Good. Absolutely. We're, we're here to make this as easy as possible. And um, obviously, um, your success is our success. So absolutely love to see you. I'd love to see you at a live course. So we have many to pick from. So please pick a fun place. I don't know where you are. Maybe you want somewhere cold or maybe you want somewhere hot. I'm from Chicago right now. We could do it with a bit of warmth. So I think Miami's <laughs> in the future, all sorts of different ones. So, um, Dr. Gade, I, I see your question. How did, how does the insurance work? That's actually a great question. And we, that's one of the things that we actually go over. We have a, one of our study clubs, we actually have a specialist that comes on who works with us as a, a consultant with us, who goes over all the ins and outs of insurance billing. Um, so it, it's a, yeah, so we, we go all of those kinds of things we go over, um, in that digital course. Um, so another, I, oh, go ahead. Yes. I might add that, um, if a child has orthodontic coverage in their dental policy, we have never been refused. So um, with dental insurance, it's a much easier conversation. The medical, it's a little bit more difficult because it's so new, um, but we'll discuss that in the class. Um, some suggestions, ins and out, and what we're um, doing to move the needle forward in that arena as well. Absolutely. So um, Dr. Brigitte is wondering, um, how do you convince physicians that this will help a child's breathing? Well, um, so let's talk about collaboration. So we work with pediatricians, we work with ENTs, we work with sleep specialists, pulmonologists, and cardiologists. Um, I, I'll throw in school nurses as well. So when we, we kind of refer to them as our dream team, it is really important to have that collaboration with all of those entities. So let's talk first about an ENT. Well, obviously an ENT, um, sometimes it's an easier conversation than others if we feel that um, a child has, say for instance, kissing tonsils or the tonsils are very large and we want a specialist to take a look at it prior to us starting with Healthy Start. And maybe that ENT will say, yes, we're gonna go ahead and um, remove the tonsils and the adenoids. It's a really important conversation to have with the ENT. We do invite ENTs to our live courses as well um, because 70% right now of tonsils and adenoid removal fail. And the reason why they fail is because they're not addressing the other areas, narrow palate, improper growth and development of the lower third, and improper habits. Um, and these areas need to be addressed because otherwise that surgery is not going to be successful. You'll see when we talk about failures, we're talking 
After about six months, we see the children going back to the same habits they had before. So it's really important the ENT realizes it's a collaboration. And we've been very successful in creating that conversation. A sleep physician, um, we, we go to the AASM. Um, it was crazy. The first year we were there, we had no idea. Um, the first five minutes, we had 100 sleep physicians in our booth asking us to please just provide them with providers' names because they truthfully don't have anything. Um, typically, they say the two points of um, treatment is either um, a tonsil or the adenoids being removed. And um, they know that 70% of the time that hasn't always successful. Expanders is another one. Again, only addressing one area of this important conversation. Um, pediatricians, to be really honest, pediatricians, their usual comment is the child will grow out of it. So we will help you with that conversation. Um, we had a doctor in Indiana just recently that ended up, after talking to his pediatrician, actually speaking. He was the first dentist ever to speak in front of their physicians group. Um, I think it was 200 of pediatric physicians and explaining what this was. That sleep questionnaire is so critical. That is the tool of choice and providing that even to the pediatrician to have a parent fill that out. Or more importantly, if they would prefer to refer them to your office and you can work in conjunction, that's another area. Obviously, pe pediatricians are extremely busy. I don't know what your pediatrician looks like, but mine, it, it's a zoo. I've never seen so many patients. So even getting their attention for a little bit is hard. But when they see a patient come or refer back, um, I just had a call from a pediatrician's office in Michigan he had two patients that came in and um, the doctor went through his list and he said, how are their allergies and asthma and blah, blah, blah. And she said, I have the greatest tool that ever was invented. It's called Healthy Start. My kids don't have those asthma issues or those allergies. And that was the key to this. Do you know that pediatrician called our office to tell us what happened? Now, do you think he is going to be a good person to continue that conversation with his other parents? Absolutely. So that's kind of the conversation that's going around. School nurses are another one, critical, especially with those kids, they're suspecting ADD and ADHD. Give them the sleep questionnaire or send them to the Healthy Start website. Um, we also help doctors to provide a website that has a mini questionnaire on it so it can direct those patients directly into your practice. But just these are some of the services we provide and we try to make it um, as accessible for not only the medical profession, but the parents that come from those professions to find you as their provider. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so Dr. Gade, you're asking about, um, you know, how do we get those Patients, do we do we do anything to help? Rather, not how do we, but do we do anything to help to get those patients through the door? And we really are um, such advocates for helping our providers get the word out. You know, we're really about parent education. Um, you know, doctor education is so important. Parent education is just the ultimate. And so we are, um, we actually do parent webinars every Tuesday night. And these are more general webinars out to the general public, you know, just teaching parents what to look out for in their kids, what the symptoms are. A lot of these kids, parents have no clue that, you know, heavy breathing or snoring and these kinds of things are associated or are habits of sleep related breathing disorders. They have no idea what the symptoms are, but when they do and that light bulb clicks on, it is, it, it opens their eyes and they realize, oh my gosh, there's a, there's another, there's hope. I have another way of, of, you know, trying to help my, my child. So we're really about parent education, but we actually do, um, we work with our providers to actually do these presentations in your local area as well. So we reach out to the parents in your area. We reach out to that demographic. We um, try to educate the parents in your area to try to push them through your door. Um, and again, you know, at the, by the end of this, res, um, this presentation, I mean, they're excited. They're thanking you. I mean, you know, in many cases, I mean, their kids are being um, pushed towards medication or surgery and things like that. So to know that there is a non-invasive way, um, and, and unfortunately, those things are just band-aids, you know, they're not fixing the problem you know we have we have something that can fix the problem so anyway so yes we are very um 
much ready to to help our providers with their uh, promotion ex, um, efforts in, in reaching out to those parents. I, I think also realizing, um, you know, I'm a little bit older, that social media, I, I really, I mean, we all understand um, the prevalence of social media, but I think sometimes we're not aware of how effective and how um, great the reach is. So typically with these presentations, we reach on average about to 2,000. Our largest one was 18,000 parents in one night. That's huge. How are you going to reach that many patients in the course of one hour? It, it is really mind boggling how um, fast um, social media works, um, the effect of the share, um, parents sharing with other parents. So um, again, it, it's a huge tool that obviously we utilize. Um, we love to have um, our providers be the um, educators in those parent webinars. And we, we help, we provide um, PowerPoints, we make you 100% successful. Um, we'll tag team with you. But more importantly, we do um, solicit, we um, provide Facebook ads, we go out to different groups, ADD groups, things like that in your community to make them aware of that presentation and um, bring them into the audience so that you um, can receive those numbers and hopefully transfer them into patients into your practice. So it's, it's an it's a important instrument that we utilize. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yes, um, another question, will the webinar be available for us to watch? Absolutely. Um, this has been recorded tonight, so um, we will actually send out the URL so you guys will have it to, to refer back to um, if you need to to answer any additional questions that, that you have. Um, okay, so we have one quick question. Um, if we want to bring two doctors um, to, to the, a live course or to join the digital course, how much would it be um, to bring in a, an additional associate uh, or to, uh, two additional associates? Um, well, typically it's 3400 We do um, give a reduction for additional ones, and we can provide you those numbers. Usually it's... Um, $500 off or something to that effect, um, depending on the amount of doctors. Um, once you become a provider, you're provider for life. And um, we just want to make sure that everyone is aware because it, it, it's not just um, providing a pencil to your patient. It, it is a different way of looking at it. We want to make sure everybody is doing the absolute most for those children and um, kind of going through that whole um, providership. Um, please realize that the digital does provide 18 hours of CE credit. And when you go to the live course, you will then receive an additional 16 hours of credit, CE credit. So, um, you know, depending how you work it, you can do one in one year and one in the next. So you pretty much um, covered a lot of that cost. So um, hopefully that helps your answer or answers your question. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So I would like to say thank you for um, to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, this has been a great a, a great evening. Your questions have been absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I, it's such a um, wealth of information. I, I know, and every every time we do this, it's um, you know I, I think that it's such important information to get out there. And every single time we do this, it's an eye opener for everybody. So um, there actually was one more question that came in and I'm so sorry I missed it. Um, the question is, what are the costs, what basically what are the lab fees for a typical four to seven year old case? Well, I can answer that pretty quickly. So um, we definitely, we um, typically have two price structures um, for a um, five, to or maybe at six to 12 year old, it's usually around $600. Um, the younger ones, it is $700, um, but that will include a diagnostic, um, the diagnostic forms, we provide a treatment plan that we have one to two of our providers go over so that we become uh, sort of a consultant with you. So we can provide our thoughts on the case. And then obviously you would perform the treatment of your choice, but it gives you a few extra ideas. It also provides you with the appliances that you will need for treatment. Um, typically, um, the cost of the Healthy Start 
um, is somewhere between 37 to maybe $4,700. Um, obviously, we've heard more, we've heard less, we're not here to dictate the prices. Um, but some important notes is that the treatment time will take you anywhere from two to three hours of total chair time. 10% will be provided by the provider himself. The other is staff driven. Um, the, obviously there is um, tremendous profitability with this system. There's nothing wrong with being profitable. We all have to keep our doors open. But on the side of a parent, um, it provides a tremendous service. Um, we do sometimes use this as an ultimate phase one. We find that 93% of our cases will finish out, um, probably require no further orthodontics. Um, the other ones, if they do require further orthodontics, it's a very short phase two, um, maybe a couple months um, within um, braces or thereabouts or whatever technique. And it's just fine tuning the case. Um, so hopefully that answers those questions um, and provides you with some structure um, with the fees, um, how much you charge for the um, treatment with your patients, as well as um, kind of what your profitability be, would be with this system. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Well, thank you guys so much, Leslie. Thank you so much for taking time out of your night tonight to, um, you know, just lecture and teach about this very important information. Um, and, and thank you guys for being on. Absolutely fantastic for taking time out of your night tonight to learn. So um, everybody have a wonderful evening and a great day tomorrow. Thank you. Good night, Good night. everybody. Bye-bye.